Okay, there are a number of the people in the comments who want to go back and forth about with investing that literally I have people in the comments who are like, oh, I got rich investing in stocks. I got rich investing in crypto. And whenever I ask for proof, they run away. This has been happening for years. Every time I ask for substantial proof that you invested money in the stock market or you invested money in crypto and you made a lot of money really, really quickly. When I ask for proof, I never get it, which makes me think that these people are lying. So here's a guy at the plain bagel investing won't make you rich properly. He did this video three years ago. Let's go ahead and react to it. Hey guys, it's Richard. You're watching The Plain Bagel. Welcome to another party pooper video where I ruin everyone's fun and you're sat at the end of the video. Today I wanted to cover a high level concept uh, because 2018 was a crazy year with things like Bitcoin, the weed stock rally, tech stock rally. Uh, it was a very strange year for investments. You know, some investments did very well and some came crashing down. And I think that for people who started investing in 2018, it offered some very strange experience uh, that might have you know, skewed what they expect from investments. Um, and I also wanted to cover this topic because I've been getting a lot of dumb YouTube ads about uh, people selling trading strategies. You know, People saying, oh, I've used this one strategy, this very simple strategy for 10 years and I've made millions of dollars or whatever. Um, I think those are very harmful and in the current environment, advertisements like that and programs like that are left to thrive, uh, usually at the detriment of many investors. So I wanted to take a moment to make a very sobering statement, which is that investments won't make you rich, probably, at least not in the short term. Investments are able to bridge the gap. Notice that he explicitly said short term. I am constantly hit over the head with people claiming that they've got rich investing very quick within a matter of months or a matter of a few years. This guy, he works in the investment world. He has a job at a bank. This is something he deals with on the professional level. Between what we have and what we need, but it's not able to make wealth out of thin air. And I'll explain later why I think that having this mentality that investments can make you rich is not only foolish, but it can be harmful to your own financial well-being. Uh, but we'll start by going over the three points that I maintain show uh, why investments won't make you rich. And the first one is that you need money in the first place to become rich with investments. Even if you make an incredible investment decision, you need money in the first place for that. How many times have I said this? How many times? I have literally had people come at me in the comments talking about, you don't need a large brokerage account. You don't need money. Literally. And I have looked at it. There's a girl by the name of the Humble Trader. And she talks about how she made $25,000 and she had a million dollar brokerage account. She bought like 6,000 shares of the stock and the price came up to a million dollars. I consistently see this, and once again, many folks are on this pipe dream, this fantasy that they can turn $100 into $100,000 real quick, real fast. It's simply not true. But to reap proper rewards. If you invest $1,000 and earn 100%, that's great, but you made another $1,000, which doesn't make you rich. Uh, you know, great return, but you're not quite there yet. And people might point to individuals who have made a lot of money off of investments and, you know, say, well, they did it, why can't I? But there was a survey done by Spectrum Group, which pulled households uh, with net values between $100,000 and $1 million outside of their primary residence. So in addition to the value of the house that they lived in. And they were asked to rate some core beliefs on a scale of 0 to 100 based on how important they believed it was uh, for them creating their wealth. So basically asking them, you know, how did you get to this point in your life where you have this wealth at your disposal? 
And what they found was that most of the highly rated statements all had to do with savings, not key investment decisions. And one of the highest scoring statements with a uh, average score of 81.98 was the following. A dedicated and regular savings program is something I consider very important. So a lot of these people made their wealth from saving money, not from investing uh, alone. I have a whole course that is centered around money management and saving money. Saving money. And I think it's important to always come back to this idea that before we make incredible financial decisions, we need to be fiscally responsible. Uh, you know, your investments will only do as well as your savings program. Uh, if you're spending more money than you're making with investments, well, you're negating the whole impact of, of smart investing. My second point as to why I maintain that investments won't make you rich is that on average, investments don't make anyone rich. The S&P 500 for the past 90 years has an annual return, average return of 9.8% which by the way is pretty darn good in the world of investments. If you could lock in 9.8% for the rest of your life, I, I'd go all in, I'd, I'd certainly lock that in, but it's not going to make you a millionaire overnight. You can just do the math to see that. Let's say for example that you have $10,000 to invest um, and you're able to get that S&P 500 average return of 9.8%, ignoring taxes and fees, which uh, would probably bring that down a few percentage points. Uh, but let's say you invest that amount and you earn this return, it would take you 51 years to hit a million dollars with that amount. So unless you start investing... How many times have I said that? How many times have I said that? That when you start off with a small amount of money, it will take you 40 to 50 years to turn it into a million. I've said that over and over and over and I literally have people coming from me, chopping my head off, talking about, well, you don't need a large brokerage account. No, you don't need a lot of money. Seen at the age of 15 with $10,000, you're probably not going to hit a million dollars by the age of 65. Um, you know, you might get close and, and by all means, uh, it also shows you the power of investing, but you're not going to hit that milestone in a very short period of time. Now, like I said, a lot of people, when they think about investing and they think about earning high returns, they want to do so in the short term. Um, so let's say that you instead want to, with the $10,000, hit a million dollars within 10 years. Uh, with that, you would need to be earning a return of 59% every year for the 10 years. And it's not likely that you'll find one investment that can earn you that amount. Most investments, uh, from you know my understanding, will earn you a high return for a few years if they're a high growth company and then kind of taper out. So that means that you have to continually find more ideas and more companies that are in that early stage and earning that you know almost 100% return. And you need those picks to outweigh the bad picks you make. Because certainly if you're in that world of investments, you're gonna find some negative return positions, you're going to lose some money on these startup ideas. So it's kind of foolish to assume that you'll be such an outlier that while other people are earning sub 10%, you'll be making 59% a year and hitting that million dollar mark. If you do, great. And it's not to challenge people who claim they have done that. Maybe some people have. But again, for the rest of us, probably not likely. And my third and final point as to why you won't become a millionaire by investing is that you're actually kind of bad at investing. <laughs> I mean that in the most sincere way possible. Because we as humans are terrible investors. We have all these biases and these shortcomings that really, you know, if you look at the data, it's pretty embarrassing, you know, the kinds of mistakes that we make over and over again and how we struggle to overcome. Right now, we're entering into a bear market. Right now. And for the last 11, almost 12 years, we were in a bull market where a monkey throwing darts at a wall could pick a good stock. Now we're about to see the people who have investment skills, investment strategies, and can make money in a bad market. Now there are people who can do this, but they're not the norm. They're, they, these people are exceptional. These people are exceptionally talented. They graduated from MIT. They are PhDs. They're working at these large firms. This is not your average retail investor. 
overcome these biases that lower our returns over time. I mean, there are these studies called the Dalbar studies, which are released every year, and they show the returns of mutual fund investors. Um, and the most recent issue, which was from 2017, showed that over the past 20 years, the S&P 500 earned an annual average return of 7.68%. So that's uh, obviously less than the 90-year average, but still you know, decently high. Whereas the average equity fund investor only made 4.79% a year. So almost three percentage points less than the index, than the average. Now, I know some people would look at that and say, well, of course, these people are using active mutual funds. Uh, you know, if they were just passive investors, they would uh, earn the index return, maybe less a bit of a fee. But fees aren't actually the reason why uh, they did so poorly. Dalbar actually highlighted the three top factors that led to this underperformance. And none of them have to do with fees or investment strategy. In fact, the top three factors for the underperformance were capital not being available uh, to invest, capital being needed for other purposes, and the third point is psychological factors. One of the examples they highlighted is that so many investors sell when the markets are down. And the Dalbar study showed that the average retention rate of these active mutual funds were 3.8 years meaning that on average people could only stand their investments for 3.8 years uh, to hold these funds before they jumped ship and tried something else. And based on the examples we covered earlier, you need a long-term period to make money off of investments, and we can't even make it to the four-year mark. Uh, so it just goes to show how bad of investing we are on average. And there are specific biases that kind of explain why we make these poor decisions, and they've been defined time and time again uh, and it's worth highlighting them. Uh, one of them, for example, is the loss aversion bias. One of the biggest ones, which is when things are down, we want to cut our losses. We worry about losing more money, and that often leads us to selling at the worst possible time. There are things like anchoring, which is when something happened in the past, we have a hard time changing our perception of how things should occur in the future based on this past event. Bitcoin is a great example of that. Some people saw the massive return of Bitcoin and are still holding on thinking, that that return is going to repeat because it happened in the past, it should happen again. But that's an example of anchoring. There's also hurting, which is the idea that we often follow the decisions of other people. So when markets are down, we tend to follow the herd and do what they do because we don't want to, you know, stick our neck out and try something different because it might turn out poorly. And then there's things like regret aversion, which is kind of the same idea where we don't like the feeling of regret, obviously. but that can thereby paralyze us in making decisions. We don't want to regret uh, selling when things are high. We don't want to regret uh, you know, holding on when things are low. We worry about making decisions that are tough, and thereby we usually don't make a decision when we need to. And it's kind of funny, you know, the only way to become a great investor is to acknowledge that you're a terrible investor, to, to see these flaws and to be aware of them, to know that you know, I might make a bad decision what are the steps I can take to avoid that, to make sure I don't you know, succumb to the behavioral biases I have? And you know, it certainly doesn't help that we have all these ads from rich people flaunting their wealth and saying, you know, I'm gonna show you how to make money, uh, you know, trying to sell you on the idea of uh, getting rich quick. And you know, I get it, I get And this is something that I have been railing against, railing against, talking about it. This whole notion that you can get rich in a matter of weeks or just a few months is one of the things that is holding you back from building real wealth because you're impatient. And there's this notion out here that you can sprinkle some hustle dust on something and then you will be instantaneously rich. It's not going to happen unless you win the lottery and look at the odds of winning the lottery. That if you're trying to show people that you made a lot of money doing something that you should probably show them your money. Whereas I'm here in front of my Ikea furniture, you know, trying to tell you how you should invest. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it really, it can really be used to abuse the viewer. Uh, these people basically promise these things to you. They show you these things and they say, I can offer you this through this five-step program or through this marketing strategy. And yet, I would argue that most of these people, I, I would bet that most of these people 
made most of their money from marketing, not from their strategy that they are selling you. If you ever get an advertisement of someone selling you a trading strategy and saying, and I brought this up in no shade to Terry Imajima, but Terry Imajima did not get to $10 million earned in a year until she started selling her trading course. Terry Imajima, I don't know what her numbers are, but I would not be shocked if Terry has made 30 to 50 times more money from her course than she actually made from trading. This will earn you 20% or 30% return, guaranteed. Just ask yourself, you know, why are they selling this to you? Because if this person really had a proven trading strategy that could earn them, you know, above par returns, they should just sell it to a hedge fund. They could be paid millions of dollars for selling the strategy. Why are they selling it to you through a YouTube ad? Chances are it's because they know the hedge fund won't bite, but you might. And don't get me wrong, there's a difference between programs that educate and programs that promise high returns. I can't fault someone for selling an educational program, even if it's a few thousand dollars, to say, I'm going to show you the world of investments and show you how it works. But some of these people are saying, I'm going to show you one simple trading strategy that will make you a lot of money. And maybe you haven't seen these advertisements for these trading strategies and stuff, and you know, you might think, well, Richard's just being cranky, he doesn't want people to find out how to invest and to make a lot of money because then they'll stop watching his videos. But it's not just me being, you know, a bit cranky. I, I am a cranky guy. I know that. But it's not just that. The SEC on its website has a warning about these advertisements, about programs that promise to train you to show you how to earn high returns. Uh, and I'll share the link down below showing the warning. But it just goes to show, like, this is a real problem. This is something that a lot of people are losing money on. But anyway, to tie this all back, Investments probably won't make you rich, and that's okay. You know, investments are still a great tool. If used over the long term, they can make you a lot of money, even with a you know, single-digit return. But you just need to gauge your expectations. You need to make sure that you aren't expecting too much from the world of investing. Because I think when you have high expectations, these uh, above 20% returns every year, and you don't reach them, it's that gap where you're more likely to make a poor behavioral decision. Or you might sell low because you've lost money in a given year and you thought you were going to be making 20% a year. And you know what? It's tough to be a good investor in this day and age. With social media, all the news about people making millions of dollars, uh, every day it seems like we're being bombarded with stories of you know get-rich-quick schemes and people just becoming unbelievably wealthy. But you know what, that will always exist. You can do so well in investments and finance and there will always be someone with more money than you, with more than you have. You know, investing isn't about being better than other people. It's about reaching your financial goals. And one person's financial goal might be higher or lower than someone else's. It doesn't matter. What matters is, you know, reaching those goals and being happy with it. So I hope you like this video, guys. Uh, I'm sorry it was kind of unorganized, but I, I, it was just something on my mind that, you know, after seeing all these ads for these trade strategies, it kind of festered for a while, and I just wanted to post a video about it. If you liked it, make sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell icon. Okay. Uh, Richard did that first video three years ago, and he made this one a year ago. Investing still won't make you rich, probably. Let's dive in. Hey guys, Richard, you're watching The Plain Bagel. I was thinking of videos I could do while I'm kicked out of my studio, uh, while I'm kind of stuck in this office. And I thought it would be a good idea to revisit an older video I did over two years ago titled, Investing Won't Make You Rich, Probably. This is a video I put out fairly early on in my YouTube career, if you want to call it that, where I talked about these get rich quick ads that I was getting on YouTube. It was kind of the first time I had seen these sorts of ads where these people were in front of their private jets and their fast cars and their mansions talking about how easy it was to get this sort of lifestyle through a trading program or a course or whatever it was they were selling. And I was very frustrated by them because I saw them as taking advantage of the market exuberance at the time. Because as I put it in the video, 2018 was a crazy year. I didn't know. <laughs> I, I didn't know. <laughs> and the video did really well. It seemed to circulate the online finance YouTube space. I received the blessing of the Level 100 finance YouTuber Graham Stephan. It garnered a smaller at the time but quickly growing Meet Kevin response video. It even spawned a few copycat videos, which uh, I'm flattered <laughs> that the video is worth copying and honestly just find it kind of funny. So really no gripes there. <laughs> I want to revisit this topic because I think the message I was trying to get across is 
even more applicable today. Things have kind of only gotten worse from then. We've seen an endless list of new NFTs and crypto projects, many of which don't have any merit, but are simply trying to take advantage of that hype around them. Uh, we've seen celebrities promoting these cryptos and being paid to you know, pump up these assets. And unfortunately, it seems like a lot of everyday investors are the ones who are passionately posting about these things, you know, talking about how it's going to be the thing that changes their life. Now, I know I'm a chronic party pooper, but I can't appreciate that some people are memeing when they say to the moon or see you at the top, but some people aren't. So I wanted to put out another party pooper video to reiterate the points from my original video, but I also wanted to take the time to clarify my original message because obviously with the admittedly more clickbait title, uh, some misconstrued the message as being anti-investment. In fact, the Meet Kevin video was a critique of mine that labeled the section that talked about my video, investing makes you poor, uh, which obviously I don't believe. <laughs> so let me clarify up front what I mean when I say investing will make you rich, probably. Because as you hopefully know, I'm an advocate for investing. <laughs> it is my whole channel. <laughs> First of all, by rich here, I'm not referring to being financially independent or set for retirement because I do believe that investing can take a lot of people to that point. Uh, you know, there's still work yet to put in, but investing is that great tool that closes that gap between where we are and where we need to be for retirement. What I'm referring to is that kind of wealth that's being marketed in these videos, say being over the long term. If you start investing responsibly in your 30s, and you can keep at it, by the time you're 60, you should have a substantial amount of money invested. But here's the thing. There is so much stuff out there that has literally convinced people that they can start investing and literally become a millionaire in a matter of months or a few years. And it is simply not true unless you have a lot of money to invest. The quickest way to become a millionaire through investing is to start with 500,000. If you start with 500,000, yeah, you can reach a million fairly quickly because you had a lot of money to start investing in. In like a multimillionaire where you can afford a fast car and it's not really going to put a dent into your retirement savings. And I'm also referring to getting rich in the short term as in say under 10 years, uh, because obviously the longer time you have, the more money you can compound and really anyone can become the richest person in the world if they have all the time in the world. So probably a better way to word it would be investing or even speculating won't make you rich in the short term, probably. <laughs> and I always include that probably because yes, there are stories of people, you know, making a killing off of Bitcoin or whatever. But the point here is that investing can only do so much. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's not a miracle worker. And you need to fuel your returns with savings, with money that you've earned from active income, say, and put into the market. It's very rare for individual positions to skyrocket by such a degree that it changes your financial situation. And anyone who tells you that you can go from a minimum wage working cashier to a private jet flying, yacht riding millionaire through just investing, through taking you know that small amount of savings and putting into promising positions that will skyrocket, they're likely trying to scam you. <laughs> One word, Carl Renfield, the guy who was a cashier who claims to become a billionaire in five short years. Or at the very least, sell you something that's probably not in your interest. And to try to exhibit the limits of investing, I want to go through a few exercises to show you the numbers of certain scenarios so you can better kind of comprehend what investing is capable of, you know, and the great tool that it is, but also its limitations. As you probably know, the long-term average of the S&P 500 is roughly 10%. So you could view that as being the market return that most people are able to access if they just put their money into, say, an index fund. And 10% is a solid return. Over the long term, not many people actually are able to achieve that amount. But the thing is, this 10% is both before taxes as well as before inflation. And when you consider those two variables with some assumptions, the return that you actually see is closer to 5.4%, almost half of the original return. It's not nothing and certainly better than a savings account return, but it's not exceptional either. So now to demonstrate what that return might mean for an investor, let's say that you start off with $10,000 and you want to reach a million dollars just by investing that $10,000 at this market rate. In real after-tax terms, it'll take you 87.6 years to become a millionaire, to reach that $1 million mark. Uh, which obviously isn't going to work for most people. <laughs> 
But if you add savings to the mix, that time period shortens quite a bit. So let's say that every year you put $3,000 into the market in addition to that initial investment. So it's about $200 a month that you're putting into your investment account. At this market rate that you're able to achieve, it would take you 52.8 years to turn that $10,000. Did he say if you start with $10,000 and you put $200 per month in the market, it would take you 52 years to get to a million dollars. So if you started at 20, you'll be 72 before you were a millionaire, only putting a little amount of money. Now, if we as humans had a life expectancy of 150 years, this would work like gangbusters because you could start at 20 and by the time you're a hundred, you might have two or three million dollars in another 50 years to live. But average life expectancy is about 77. So you become a millionaire at 72, then you die at 77. Big whoop. There's plus your savings into a million dollars. So great, we've shaved off a lot of time, but that's still a bit bigger than most people's average career length. You're still spending a lot of your life just to get to a million dollars. So how do you get there sooner? Well, you can increase your savings, you know, try to earn a bigger income so that you can get more money going into the market. Whether that be starting a business or taking on education to earn a... Now, let's look at the math. If you're investing 20000 a year, which is like $1,800 per month, it still takes 20 four years still takes almost 25 years at twenty thousand dollars so to really crank this down you need to be at about thirty thousand dollars a year invested to really get to your million dollar mark or beyond much quickly better job anything that lets you save more money but let's say that instead of saving money, you focus instead on the return aspect. You say, you know, I only have this $10,000, I can only put aside $200 a month, let's focus on bumping up that return figure, and you know what, while we're at it, let's try to get to that goal of a million dollars in real terms again, um, within a 10 year period like we mentioned earlier. With these variables, to reach that million dollars in a 10 year period, you would need a after tax real return of 51.5% which means that you need a pre-tax nominal return, so what you actually earn with your investments, of 72.7%. Now, admittedly, that's a little high. <laughs> for reference, some of the best investors in the world, like Peter Lynch and Warren Buffett, are on record for only earning a, only, <laughs> a long-term average return of 20 to 30%, roughly, in that range. So it's kind of foolish to assume that you'd be able to beat the market to such a degree that you would earn roughly triple, or more than triple, what these famous investors themselves are on record achieving. But you might say, Richard, this time is different. Uh, this is the age of the pudgy penguins and NFTs of rocks. Uh, this is an opportunity that we've never had before. Uh, not really. <laughs> it's not the first market exuberance, you know, rally, if you will, that we've had around certain assets. Automobiles, biotech computers, the internet, these are all things that had rallies around them and especially with the dot-com bubble, we saw returns like we've seen with some of these positions. But importantly, these returns were all temporary. They were all short-term returns that moderated over the long term. They weren't able to consistently offer that return that would be needed to, like I mentioned, revolutionize your life. Not to mention that on top of all this, there's the research that shows that A, most people aren't even able to achieve the market return thanks to behavioral biases and limitations with their trading and investing strategy, but also B, that asset allocation, so the asset class that you put your money into, tends to play a bigger role in the return you see than security selection, than the individual things you pick. So chances that picking the right pudgy penguin will pay for your retirement, uh, they're a little slim. <laughs> so hopefully I've demonstrated just how rare it is to completely change your lifestyle thanks to these specific stocks or NFTs or cryptos or whatever that you pick. But I think it also helps to talk about how people do get rich then. How do people get to that point where they're able to own these fast cars and private jets? Uh, or even less so, to just be a multimillionaire 
and be sound financially and not have to worry about how much money you're bringing in. Well, in my original video, I highlighted a Spectrum Group survey that talked to households with net worths between $100,000 and $1 million dollars outside of their primary residence. And they asked these people, you know, how did you get to where you are? And one of the things they did was they asked them to rank certain principles in terms of how important they were to getting to where they are today. And one of the highest ranking sentiments was the following statement, a dedicated and regular savings program is something I consider very important. It earned a 81.98 score on the 2016 survey. Now this was the main premise of me, Kevin's video, was that in this survey, I was focusing on the lowest bucket of these households. Now, if you go to the higher buckets, you know, the 1 million to 5 million and the 5 million and up ranges, that these people have more of their assets invested than the lower buckets. And that's true. You know, these people are investing a lot of their money. Which is exactly the opposite of what we were told in Plain Bagel's video, that saving is actually what makes you rich and investing is not. But I don't view a savings program as being mutually exclusive from investing. And I don't think that's how it was interpreted in the survey. I think it's just saying, you know, these people try their best to not spend all their money. <laughs> okay. Uh, when you have income that's above and beyond what you need to live on, let's say you make $500,000 a year and your burn rate, the amount of money that you need to maintain yourself is 150. You have a lot of money to save and invest. So it is not strange or unusual for these people to have more money invested because they have more money to invest. Whereas people at the bottom of the range, they struggle to come up with money to invest. If you're making $500,000 a year, uh, I think taxes are going to hit you at about 150, which is going to leave you 350. So if you're living on 150, you have $200,000 a year to invest. Or literally, you could buy a piece of rental property out in the Midwest, cash money every year. It's a totally different ball game when you already have money. And in fact, if you actually look at the millionaire and the ultra high net worth groups, they actually scored higher on the same statement. The millionaire group scored at 84.14 and the ultra high net worth group scored it at 85.52. So it seems to me that when you ask people who are millionaires, an important factor for their success is their prudence, how they saved their money, didn't spend it and use that money to grow their wealth. And at least anecdotally, this lines up with my own experience working in the field. As many of you know, I work for a money manager where we have a minimum investment amount of $500,000. So a lot of our clients are high net worth clients, if not ultra high net worth. And the vast majority of clients have gone to that point by either owning a business, having a very high paying job, having a you know more average paying job, but being very prudent with their spending, or the fourth bucket being inheritance. <laughs> that's actually surprisingly a very <laughs> high group. So that's... Notice what he said. The number one thing he said own a business, own a business. Number two, have a high salary. Number three, average salary per prudence. Number four, inheritance. Not one of these people in this bucket who are contributing to this high yield investment fund where you have to have 500,000 to get into it are investors, not a one. Number one, own a business. Number one, own a business. I've been screaming this. I've been jumping up and down. I have been talking about this for years and I have all of these lying, fake investors saying, oh no, Glendon, you don't have to do that. No, Glendon, no, no. You could go ahead and take this $100 and flip it into Forex or Bitcoin and get to 100K in two weeks. A strategy as well for getting rich. So all that is just to say that if you put millionaires into different categories, the group that you know got to be a millionaire thanks to a certain investment kicking off is probably one of the smallest groups out there. And it's clearly not the most reliable way to get into that stage in your life. And if you see someone who's wealthy promoting something, using their wealth to try and prove to you that this thing works, most of the time they didn't make their own money from that thing, but rather either the selling of that program or some other thing that's totally unrelated or different from what they're selling you. But Logan Paul obviously didn't get rich from Dink Doink. And that's not to say that people shouldn't be able to make cryptocurrencies and NFTs and all this stuff. That's truly not what I'm trying to get at here. 
I'm not trying to say that we should heavily regulate the space, but I do think there need to be more protections in terms of how these things are marketed. That applies both to trading courses and to actual assets. There's a reason that you don't see financial advisors saying, guys, this stock is going to the moon. <laughs> it's because they're heavily regulated and that's incredibly unethical. <laughs> and yet you can have people who made a cryptocurrency promote it as an incredible revolutionary investment opportunity that will make you a billionaire. And then you know, when you challenge them, it's, oh, it's not financial advice. This is just a social experiment, if you will. Uh, but guys, one that will make you a lot of money. Trust. But until we see more action, we are largely left to fend for ourselves. So if you see an opportunity that's being presented to you as life changing, as something that will make you rich, that you know is very easy, very short term, and could change your life, just ask yourself, why are they selling it to you? Why are they selling to you, say a YouTube viewer, instead of a higher net worth person with more money? Why to you and not a hedge fund that could pay millions, if not billions up front for a proven investing strategy or asset? Why sell you this thing up front instead of just agreeing to manage your money on your behalf and earning these returns themselves and earn a very sizable fee doing so over a long period of time? The answer, of course, is because they don't have a promised method for earning these returns. And in taking this approach where they sell you the asset, they sell you the course or whatever it is, they are transferring the risk of that thing not turning out as they said it would to you, the buyer. So of course they'll say whatever it takes to get you to buy that thing because once you've taken it, they've made their money, they're done. And they don't need it to pan out anymore. So that's a lot of rambling for me, but what's the takeaway? Well really it's just, there's no cryptocurrency, NFT, stock, or trading course that substitutes being financially responsible and in some cases earning an active income. You can't go from zero to hero. There's only so much investing can do. And really, like I said, it's not a miracle worker. You do have to give it something to start compounding. It's a bummer, but the sooner you recognize that, the sooner you can start investing responsibly and seeing your returns compound. I know after all this, some people call me a hater or a fun wrecker, a party pooper, hopefully actually, if, uh, if I did my job right. <laughs> but hey, look, I would love it if you could buy a single NFT or crypto or whatever and make all the return that you could ever need. I would love to see people who are in a desperate financial situation get to a point where they're okay all thanks to a single asset. But that's just not how it works. There's just nothing out there that's a quick fix pill that is easy to take and that solves all your problems. And you shouldn't be using investing as a crutch for very real financial problems. Because in many ways, these programs, these assets are just selling you a false sense of relief. And if you're someone who made a fortune from these things, that's awesome. It's unlikely, but certainly there are people out there. All I'm saying is that for most people, it's not a reasonable strategy to focus on that kind of return when it's very rare to see that. And please don't interpret this as a bear case for cryptocurrencies or assets or programs or whatever. You know, like I said, I don't care if you make a crypto, I don't care if you sell a trading course or whatever. It's just how these things are marketed that really gets to me. And I hate seeing these dreams sold when they're all usually just fluff. So that's all the energy I have for this video. I'll wrap it up there. Um, and I hope you found it useful. I know a video is not going to solve this problem, but at the very least, it's a vent for me <laughs> to voice my frustration with these kinds of things. As someone who works in the field and you know has studied and has seen people you know go through these things, but alternatively, have seen people improve their financial life through investing and through responsible financial strategies, I just don't like to see this kind of stuff. And I felt like I wanted to address it again, given that compared to 2018, Things seem even crazier. Anyway, thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please do comment, like, subscribe. It all helps the channel, and I very much appreciate it. And as always, be safe out there. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about Meet Kevin. Did Meet Kevin make most of his money through investing or real estate? No. Meet Kevin made the majority of his money from YouTube and running a business. And this is one of the things that you're seeing, like right no. now, uh, the FTX meltdown has caught, got me, Kevin caught up, Graham Stephan caught up, Andre Jack caught up in financial education. His name is Jeremy. I don't know what his last name is caught up pushing these get rich, ultra quick schemes. No. And they're just simply not going to work. Take this as investment advice that for you to get rich through investments, number one, you're going to need a lot of money, number two, or a lot of time, or number three, a combination of both money and time to make a lot of money through investing.